Well, good morning, everybody, or noon for some of you. Good morning. Welcome good morning. to each one. Glad to have you coming on. Of course, we will send the recording to everybody, uh, you as well. Anybody that registered will get it. So we're going to go ahead and um, get going on this just to honor the, the one hour. We said we would do this for one one hour, and we don't want to, to go past that. Although I will say that once we're done with the hour, if you want to stay on, Terry and I will continue on as long as some of you would like to chat. We'll just make that an informal offer at the end. But we want to get into our presentation today. And it's interesting that this has sparked uh, quite a bit of interest. Uh, the fact is, a lot of people are exiting or considering exiting their role now. And then with that comes the entering a new role for a whole bunch of people. And those are crucial times. And we, uh, we need help with making those transitions. Those are major transition points. And we can do them poorly and feel the pain of it. Or we could, um, we could do better. And uh, Dr. Terry Young is going to help us think through and have some ideas of, about this. And we're going to involve you in breakout rooms a little bit into the presentation as well. So be ready to participate that way. But Terry, would you just, just dive into this really important subject? Okay, thank you, Dan. Uh, great to be with all of you. And uh, as we discussed over the last number of months, um, a number of webinar topics, uh, this one seemed to, to come up uh, again and again, not only in our own conversations, but in our conversations with other people and our observations of uh, what's going on around us. Uh, as many of you know, there's been talk in recent uh, time in the last year or so of something called the Great Resignation. Mm -hmm. uh, the anticipation that in the US alone, there are probably millions of people who are resigning from roles. And uh, <clears throat> some don't like the title Great Resignation. They'd rather refer to it as the Great Exploration or something like that, because resignation seems to have quite a negative uh, connotation. But uh, in recent days, um, I was on a call with a group last week and uh, a group of uh, pastors from a denomination in Western Canada. And uh, in the early part of the call, there was just simply a reminder to pray for churches. And it was amazing the number of churches that were in transition uh, because of the need for lead pastors. Um, <clears throat> another denomination in Western Canada in one province has 24 uh, vacancies right now in lead positions. Um, the province I'm in, there's a denomination here that has, I believe, 18 uh, lead positions right now that are empty. Uh, due to resignations over the last couple of years. Um, the Fortune 500 um, companies have said in the last two years, there have been more resignations of CEOs than in any time in the history of the Fortune 500. Mm. Um, there's also an interesting uh, data set from Gallup. Um, they surveyed a group of people and two thirds of the people surveyed said they have been thinking about meaning and purpose at work more than they ever have in their entire careers. Hmm. So there's really a, there's a shift that is going on. We're seeing it around us. Um, Barna several weeks ago put out a study of pastors in the US and asked the question, have you seriously considered leaving the ministry? In uh, January of 2021, the figure was about 20 some percent. In March of 2022, the figure was 42%. So there's this wrestling with, with we're, we're in our roles. Um, we're not talking in this, in this particular webinar uh, about the issue of vocation and calling. I believe that's a deeper level um, at which we all seek to live our lives, but roles change. Um, as I've been teaching students at the seminary the last eight years or so, I, I encourage them again and again, never, never, uh, lose your, never uh, determine your identity by your role, because roles change. Um, your sense of who you are and your calling in life needs to be deeper and beyond a given role, but roles do change. And we all, <clears throat> all across our life course, 
can tell the stories of our exits from roles. Um, I probably had four or five major transitions that I've gone through in my pastoral ministry, and I've exited those roles. As I look back, uh, there are some things that I think I did well. There are some things I wish I had done differently. And we're going to have you in the breakout rooms process that a little bit of your own uh, history and maybe sharing with one another um, what was done well and what would you do differently in terms of leaving a role. So we're exploring this matter of how do we do this more wisely and uh, because life is made up of uh, this journey in which we find ourselves traveling down the road and we come to an exit ramp from a present role. Uh, we don't get there uh, often quickly. Sometimes we do. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, when you exit, we take an exit ramp, you're then on a different road and uh, you're hoping to get, find an entrance ramp to perhaps the next role. So we use this idea of the circuitous kind of pathway with some uh, markers to indicate there is an anatomy to this uh, when it is done wisely and well. So related to role exits, here's what we know from, uh, and there's a vast literature on this. Uh, one writer who's written most extensively is Elizabeth Ebaugh, and we didn't put that book in the uh, list there, but she has an intriguing book entitled Becoming an X. Um, and she, she explores the work of uh, a number of people in different vocations. Uh, she has one particular chapter on uh, interviewing and working with nuns um, who leave uh, their vocation of being a nun. And what does it mean to be an ex-nun? Mm. Um, and, and the whole matter of what that involves. But uh, there are four particular um, reasons or prompts for a role exit. Um, one is nature itself. So uh, this, is the, this is when uh, there is perhaps the, the loss of a spouse. So you have a role as a husband or a wife and a, a spouse uh, passes away. Um, cancer i've gone through that and all of a sudden it's a you've you've suddenly or maybe through a course of time you've now exited a role that you once inhabited i was married to deb for 35 years um there came a day when um she finished her earthly journey and i was a widower i, I was in a different role and nature brought that about and sometimes that is how we come to an exit. Um, the, the second uh, role exit is voluntary. So this is where we make a choice. And that's perhaps where we're going to zero in in this particular webinar. Um, the voluntary choice that we make to make our way on the road to, to some kind of exit ramp. It's voluntary. We express agency. We have control. We are making a choice and a decision. Uh, and that's voluntary. There's also involuntary. So involuntary is related to a role in work or ministry is that you, you don't, you're not in control of the choice. The decision is made for you. Someone comes in and says, we no longer need your services. We no longer want you on our pastoral staff. Um, we no longer can afford to pay you. Um, and I've worked in recent weeks with uh, uh, several who have had that kind of sad news broken to them. And it was a financial kind of hardship in the ministry. And they were told on a given day that uh, your ministry role here of many years over a decade is going to come to an end. Involuntary. Wow. Um, and those are those are processed differently than voluntary, because you don't have as much choice. Yeah. Uh, the final one is the one hopefully none of us experience, which is excommunication or banishment. Um, and that can cause a role exit. Um, oh. It's also involuntary, but it tends to go to the really, really harsh involuntary. Oh, oh my! You're God. excommunicated. You're banished. Wow. Um, and the work in the literature in this area goes into the particular deeper work, deep work that needs to be done when those kind of things happen. And this can happen in uh, very, very uh, fundamentalist kind of cults uh, where people 
find themselves on the outs and they are sent away from the village. Hmm. Their entire identity um, becomes um, up in the air. Oh man, yeah. By the way, all of these things go directly to the issue of identity. And that's something to remember about all of our role journeys and our role exits and entrances is that at the very center is identity. And uh, we'll, we'll touch on that as we go along. Um, so in the anatomy of, of a role exit, and we're now zeroing in on the many people who right now find themselves in a bit of a turbulent time of thinking through, uh, is there something next for me? In the anatomy of, of role changes and role exits, uh, the stretch of first doubts is where we begin. Uh, we just begin to begin to think about, uh, is, this, is this really what I, I want to do? Is this something I can do? Um, and first doubts are often uh, surrounded by maybe there's organizational changes that we sense. Uh, maybe we're just weary and tired. And uh, we're, we feel ourselves uh, in the early signs of maybe burnout. We don't want to go there and doubts are beginning to come in. Um, sometimes job stress, dissatisfaction can be a part of first doubts. Uh, sometimes it can be disappointment and changes in work relationships. Um, so the first doubts begin to, to uh, you know, come in. We then go into um, a, a level of twists and turns and wondering at a deeper level. And uh, as we wonder uh, at a deeper level, we're, we're really, looking at our options. We're looking at choices. We're looking at, is this reversible or irreversible? Um, is this, if it's, if it's what's called a master role, this is often very difficult for pastors who've pastored for many decades, um, is that their master role in life has been, I've been a shepherd and pastor all my life. And I'm thinking about a change I, I, in the 42% in the Barna research. Uh, this goes deep into uh, really twists and turns of wondering. This is who I've been my entire life. Who will I be if I'm not this? If I leave ministry, then who am I? And this is where the identity thing comes in. Uh, there are then turning points. Um, and the turning points may begin really in the early phase of first doubts. But I want to just touch in on the turning points. I think we're seeing this in COVID. Um, that this may be where the Barna research uh, is surfacing this. By the way, the Barna research for pastors, uh, we're being told that this is mirrored in all kinds of other vocations and callings. People in medical, uh, first responders, uh, law enforcement, uh, educators, uh, people in social work. Um, it's as if the intensity of everything has been ramped up. Uh, so the turning points um, in, in this road to an exit ramp, there are additive events. Um, there are just things that begin to happen. They're piled on. And I think COVID, the season of COVID has brought uh, more and more additive events, uh, pressure points from every angle. Uh, by the way, one of the things in the Barner research, the three reasons why pastors give for seriously considering leaving ministry, the number one is the immense stress um, that they, they're under. Secondly, is loneliness isolation. The third factor is what, what I would call um, walking in the minefield. Um, it is the political divisions and polarization and all of the things that are at foot or afoot these days um, related to our society. Those are all additive. You've got the regular pressures of your work and trying to fulfill your vocation, whether it's healthcare or education or ministry or a nonprofit organization, but then you have additive things. It begins to add up. Uh, then there's some event that it's, we call it the straw that breaks the camel's back. Uh, Elizabeth Ebaugh in her book tells the story of a Protestant minister uh, who is really wrestling with the additive events of ministry pressure and stress. Uh, his family uh, is not doing well. Uh, his family life is not doing well. Uh, he's a solo pastor. He's 24 hours on call. Um, and the, he and his wife are wrestling with this, their family life and so forth. Uh, they take a vacation and uh, 
the uh, district superintendent or one of the elders from the church or leaders of the church calls him and while he's on vacation and says, there's a member of our congregation who's make some, made some allegations about you. It was the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, because at that point, uh, the pastor said, okay, I'm done. Yeah. And that's what brought him to a pretty quick entry, exit ramp. Um, and so there, sometimes there's some event. And in the colleagues I've talked to, um, there's the additive things, there's other things that they're dealing with, but sometimes there's, they'll tell the story of that thing, that conversation, that event, where they got wind of a group of people within their church that were meeting to see how they could unseat the pastor from his pastoral role because of his stance related to vaccines or masks on the weekend, asking people to wear them at church. And that was the thing that pushed him to say, it's time for me to really consider um, some other option. Uh, the other turning point may be a time marker. And the time marker uh, sometimes can be just looking at how long I've been in a particular role, uh, had a good season. And you may look at age. Um, intriguingly, the decade points tend to be for some people, for some reason, those time markers at 40, 50, and 60. Uh, become points at which they say it's time for me to enter a new season. And so those time markers are there. Um, there's also the emergence of excuses. And this is what is found often in, uh, in first responders and healthcare workers and people in law enforcement is that they may be injured on the job. And that becomes the valid excuse to say, it's time for me to, to change. It's time for me to get to the exit ramp and do something different. I've been injured on the job. I can tell my colleagues, um, you know, I, you, you know, I was injured, uh, back problems, whatever. I, I was uh, hurt on the, on the job um, and, or, or health uh, may turn in some way. And you're able to use a health excuse or a health reason that provides some legitimacy to what you're doing. So that can be folded in. And uh, then the turning point, near the end of turning points, there's the weighing of alternatives. It's when you be, then get serious about maybe um, I could do this. What if I did this? And in the midst of all this, you're having conversations. One thing I would point out uh, is that through this entire journey, from first doubts to twists and wonderings and wanderings and the turning points before you shape the next, um, and we, we encourage this at Crest a great deal, the power of community. Um, one of the, uh, I just finished a course on resilience and I ask, I get students to, to, uh, write about a story of their own resilience. And, uh, one of them wrote about a, a role exit. And intriguingly, he said, the first thing I did is, and we refer to this as calling in the resources you need. Uh, the first thing he did was he said, I got in touch with uh, a few friends Certainly the first thing I did is I went home and I sat down with my wife and we had several hours just to talk. I then phoned my mentor and I then journeyed with my mentor for the next couple of months to process my thoughts, my emotions. Now his choice was involuntary or his exit ramp was involuntary. But even if it's voluntary, even if we're entering some first doubts, uh, find that safe few that you can begin, you can talk out loud about what's going on inside. Uh, a few other stories that were told of, of resilience, the number of uh, people who said, I went through uh, a crisis and I kept it all inside. And it, it was the difference maker, the difference maker between one story and the other was uh, calling in the resources we need. So if you're in a place where you're really wondering about a role exit, uh, find your safe few and allow them to hear you. The Quakers have a tradition called a clearness committee. Um, it's, that, it's that committee that you call together of, of good friends in the faith. And uh, you say, here's what I'm thinking about. Here's what I'm considering. And in the clearness committee, you cannot give advice. 
uh, you can only ask questions. And uh, Parker Palmer tells the story of being approached by a university to be, a, to be the president of the university. And so he calls his clearness committee and he says, I've got this exciting opportunity to be a university president and uh, I want to leave my present role and, and maybe become a university president. And uh, his clearness committee is there. And one of, his, one of the members simply says, Parker, I want to ask you a question. Why do you want to be a university president? And he ums, ums and ahs and uh, doesn't have really a clear answer. And he says, well, I think it would sort of be sort of cool to be able to, you know, be known as a university president. Uh, to which his friend did give him some advice. He said, <laughs> Parker, or he, he phrased it as a question. Parker, is that a valid reason to become a university president? <laughs> That's so, advice for the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So when we're in these considerations, um, it is so invaluable to have with you a few trusted friends that you've opened your thinking to, you've opened your heart to, uh, and you say, I'm, I'm twisting and turning, I'm wondering, I'm wandering, I've got some things, here's the, here's the events I've gone through, here's, the, here's one of the things that could be the straw that breaks my back, um, I'm wondering at the age I'm at, I'm, I'm, you know, this and that, and allow people to then probe with you in this. Because I think in our, as we share together, when I think about some of the role exits I've made where I didn't do it well, I did it solo. I did it secret, privately in my own head. And I didn't process uh, with trusted friends. And I regretted some of the, the outcome of that because I needed their wisdom. I needed their insight. So... Um, we're going we're gonna, to, after the break, uh, breakout rooms, we'll talk about making the most of an entrance ramp. So we'll get to that. But uh, Dan, pass it back to you. Um, we want to do some breakouts and uh, have opportunity to talk together about your own story of exits in particular. Um, what, have you, what have you learned? Um, what did you do well? And maybe what, what would you have done differently um, as you now look back with hindsight? And hindsight's always that, you know, it's the lowest form of <laughs> intelligence or sight, but because we all have 2020 vision looking back, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we could learn a little bit from looking back or hearing other people tell our stories so that we can actually get better at this. Because uh, just given the fact that all of us on this call are uh, people in the second half of life, you have had several exits. So this would be a good place to, to just tell a story a bit about what, what went well and what do you wish that maybe you would have done differently. So what we will do is we'll, we'll put you into these rooms for 10 minutes. We will stop recording. So there'll be no, nothing recorded in there. When we bring you back, we might get some highlights and then we'll talk about how to enter well. Any, some highlights that came out of some of the discussion that you just had in your in your group there. I know that in our group, uh, we heard se several really, really interesting stories. And um, one of them involved um, coming to a, an end and they just were, you know, they just asked to leave and there was no celebration, no thank you, nothing. They just kind of walked out the door. Hmm. And that's not a good way to, for a leader when somebody is leaving or when, when, you, when you've asked someone to leave. So there's some really you know, important insights there that depending, you know, if you're the, if you're the one that's, that's letting people go, you need to do that carefully and with appreciation. The other thing that came through in our group was that one person that was very careful to, to keep his chin up when he left, not become negative, and as a result, uh, the person that let him go five years later called him back to help him. Yeah. So don't throw grenades when you're leaving. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good idea. Yeah. Any other comments from others of you? What, what did you see or hear? One thing uh, I heard in our group is that it's uh, the way that you leave is going to determine whether you burn bridges or keep friends. 
And so keeping friends is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a high value. You just have to be careful and make sure that you don't just, just you know, leave them off or whatever, or, or too suddenly or whatever the case may be. So, yeah. yeah. I personally haven't done a whole lot of exits yet at this point in my life, but I think what I, what I have been learning and what I've been hearing is, is how much we tie our identity into, into our roles. Um, just like Terry had been, had been mentioning there. And when we leave those roles, there's sometimes a great, a great void and, and confusion of, well, where do I fit now? I've, I've tied my whole identity into this and, and now, and now what, where, where am I? So I can definitely see that, uh, that, that confusion, those, those stresses or, or strains in, in people's uh, lives after they leave something. Yep. Yep. I didn't mention this in our group, but uh, yeah, the thing about leaving well is important because uh, some years ago I was fired at one church and now I was invited back to be their transition pastor. So that was kind of a very unique and a very healing thing for some of them and for me as well. So that's kind of neat. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Very good. So you must have left well for them to call you back. I guess so. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. 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 Hmm. For, I, for those of us who don't like change, we, um, we're, we're going to be slow to, uh, to start the exit ramp. Yeah. And, um, and in my case, um, the, the, the top dozen transitions I've had in 40 years, um, the degree to which I drag my feet to, the, to that degree those transitions were ragged. Um, but the last transition that I've had, which is about approaching four years ago, was definitely the one of the best transitions that uh, I have had. And God gave me a five-year window that of anticipation that there was a transition coming. Mm. And God used my youngest son to point that out to me five years ago. Dad, you're going to be, you're going to be leaving this mission. Eventually, what are you going to do next? That was his phone call. Actually, nine years ago, he he called me out of the blue and said, hmm. "You're going to be, you're going to be transitioning." And so when we made the transition, we uh, we surround ourselves with people to help us make this transition better than previous transitions. Yeah. And we noted that the Lord had connected the dots. Talk about handwriting on the wall. He put dots on the wall. You could connect different people who said different things, mm. you know, and God was so directing us. We just had to connect the dots. Because mm. mm. God does know about your transition. Mm -hmm. And so to really pay attention to what you might be hearing, you might be sensing from the Lord in, in all this is a very key factor for us as Christian leaders. In our, in our group, I was also pointed out that uh, even though their exit maybe was not anticipated or not desired, it ended up being better. The next, the next career was better, and they were so happy that it went yeah. that way. So God can bring good even out of what it feels like negative at first. Well, Terry, let's talk about entering the next role. What are some suggestions about okay. that? Uh, great. And just on your final comment there, I, a few years ago, and I, I think I got rid of the book. So I picked up a used book somewhere and I just was intrigued by the title. It was the title of the book was I was fired and uh, I was doing some work on this area. And I thought that's an intriguing. And the gist of the book was a number of people, a whole raft of people that we would, you would know their names. And they all told their story of being fired of involuntarily being, you know, pushed off the road on an exit ramp and uh, almost without exception, they all said it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. So out of out of the adversity of such things can come uh, the grist of, of good things. Um, but there's also the the matter of the entrance or e an entrance ramp. So let me uh, go here to uh, the final slide and just some thoughts on uh, making the most of the entrance ramp and just a few things that to share with you. Uh, there is a book by Michael Watkins called The First 90 Days. So The First 90 Days Clarity, uh, there's a number of books like this out there that can give you some guidance as to what to do when you enter a new role. 
And here again, there's some, there's agency that we, we engage with ourselves. You hope you go to an organization that helps you with that process, but we don't have time here. We could all talk about um, entrance ramps to new roles mm -hmm. and how well the organization did to help us. We could also tell stories of how, how the organization basically gave us keys and said, you know, God bless you, be warmed. <laughs> we hope you figure it out. Uh, that's not a good socialization of new people. Uh, but for, as, as far as we're concerned, um, a couple things. Number one, uh, and I put it in this, in this way, get a new backpack. Or uh, with the backpack that you have carried, uh, do some cleaning out of your backpack. Uh, this comes from the uh, work of uh, Herminia Ibera uh, and her book on working identity. And uh, she makes this point that for many of us, um, as we go through our lives, um, our backpack is where, is where we place our identity papers. Um, and we also place there our wardrobe. We place our costumes. Um, and that's where our past identities we, t we, can, we can take them sometimes with us and we think, well, what I'll do now in this new role is pull out my identity of who I've been and I'll apply that in my new role. And her counsel and wisdom is um, for many of us, we need to get in touch with the person inside those clothes we've worn. We need to get past our previous roles and sometimes take out our identity papers and set, set them aside and say, that's who I was. That was my role back then. I'm now in a new place. It's now time to shape and think through uh, who will I be here? She has a wonderful quote and she, she says, uh, when you have worn out all your roles, you've cast aside all of your costumes and you've relinquished your customs, you are left with yourself in its purest form. <laughs> That's good. So, um, <laughs> in a new role, um, it's time to, you know, uh, get a new backpack and say, okay, in this new role, what am I being asked to do? Who am I being asked to be? Uh, what is the need here? Doesn't mean you don't take lessons you've learned from the past and wisdom that's crystallized, but our identity issues, we need to let go of those. Um, in our group, a few moments ago, I shared when I left first, um, I was greatly helped in my, my leaving a first alliance because I'd done some work in the previous years about this matter of distinguishing between my role and my identity. That I, my, I, I was, I was, my identity was, you're the, you're the pastor of this church. And uh, I had a, my, my doctoral advisor one day said to me, Terry, you need to distinguish between your, whatever role you fill and who you really are. And so I'd had several years to think about that. And when I came to leave and walk out the door of First Alliance as, the, as a lead pastor, teaching pastor, um, my, my transition was relatively, uh, I didn't have much heartburn at all about it because I realized, okay, that was then, this is now. And I'm not going to go around wearing the costume that I wore because I, why do that? Yeah. Um, so th there's a need to think through and this is where at the core of all of these things, role transitions, career transitions, role exits, um, is our identity and the identity work that needs to be done. So our spine of identity needs to be in our relationship with the Father. It needs to be in our relationship with God. And uh, that spine of identity, when it's strengthened in that, um, we are then able to uh, realize that the, the world is given to us as an opportunity to express our calling, our vocation, our gifts, our talents and abilities. And uh, in a new place, it's a new opportunity. And maybe you come in touch with yourself in its purest form hmm. uh, when you've taken off those costumes. Because uh, Ibera makes this point that life, uh, life can be a, a constant costume party for people. Um, <laughs> we don't know who we are without our wardrobes of identity. Hmm. We can become admiration addicts about, and that's why roles can be hard to leave. Because to a certain extent, in the world's eyes, we are who we are because of our role. Yep. Well, uh, roles change. So get a new backpack. Uh, first 90 days clarity, take some time, 
uh, and you can do this uh, individually, personally, but I think do this with a few trusted friends. Uh, get some clarity about what will the first 90 days be about? What, what are the things you sense you need to lean into? Um, and lay out some sense of a plan, your own agenda of what it is you want to discover. Find a cultural tour guide. So when you enter a new role, you're entering a culture. Uh, and, and we all know the culture, uh, every place is a unique culture. And you need a tour guide. Uh, ask around and maybe say, is there someone I could just sit down with and get a sense of uh, this place, uh, who you've been, who you are, why you do what you do, why, you, you know, and the things that, you know, give me some sense of the, uh, where are the, you know, where are the uh, fire pits from the Princess Bride, you know, where, where are the places where the, <laughs> the fire comes up from the ground? Uh, can you give me some guidance of where not to step? Um, norms, uh, what are the things I need to know that are unwritten norms? Um, that's all wise kind of uh, preparation. Well, and then carry your journal. Um, I think as you enter into a new role, it's a wise thing every day, every week to sit down and say, what did I learn this, this, this day, this week about myself and about this place and about my role? And uh, what are the things that maybe with my tour guide or with others, I can process a bit some things I've noticed. That's just wise entrance uh, into a, a new a new environment. So this is what, as far as we're concerned, what we can do. Um, there's a whole other organizational piece that we could do a lot better of helping people. Um, when I entered my new role at Ambrose, um, I remember I got there in August, August 1st, uh, 2013. Uh, there was no one around and I was there for a month sort of by myself trying to figure out, you know, what is Moodle, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and so I navigated through, I asked a few questions and that's how I learned, but not a lot of onboarding because I think they assumed you're a professional, you're an academic, you're, you should be pretty smart. Um, but it would have been nice to have uh, someone at my side say here, here's some things to do and know, and uh, here, here's what will make your transition smoother. That's the organizational piece. So, so how you. do you find this, this tour, the cultural tour guide? Like who would you ask and what are some good questions that, that, because most people wouldn't know what it means to be a cultural tour guide. Yeah. But what, yeah, what would you, what would you do? I think you're, you're, you're asking, uh, or you're simply asking maybe the people who hired you, is there anyone here that you would recommend um, to just give me, give me insight on the values and beliefs and the ways and means of this place mm -hmm. um, that could just help me understand how to be a good, uh, a good member of the community? If you frame it that way, you're not getting into the tour guide idea, but you know, and, and usually yeah. it's someone more seasoned who's been there a long time, has a mentor's heart kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I think you could also ask them and just tell me the story about this place. Yeah. Yeah. And let, let them tell you the story and listen for the values that come out of that. Yeah. And, and another, another uh, one, these are some details that come out of our, our crest a diploma program, but one of them, when you, when you're trying to discover organizational values, ask them, uh, think back over the, the last few people that were here. And, and if there were some, if, if somebody got fired, what, what were they fired for? Yeah. No names, but just what, why? And yeah. boy, values come out right there. Yeah. Why was someone let go? And then, then another one that's similar to that would be uh, who, who are considered like the heroes in this organization and why? Yeah. And when you just listen to them tell those stories, you will get, yeah. you will get a very clear understanding of what the organizational values are, where the fire pits are, where the cow pies are yep. and don't, don't uh, step on them. Yep. And that, that, that'll guide you as you're entering into your, your role there. Yeah. You may not want to ask where the bodies are buried. I mean, that, that may be a bit <laughs> of a deeper level, but, uh, <laughs> but if you, if you get any, if you find any resource on what culture is, that's where your questions can come from. Because culture is about artifacts. It's yeah. about legends. It's about myths. It's about heroes. It's about norms, values, and beliefs. It's about celebrations. Um, that's all the cultural things. And you can just sort of go down the line. What are some of the things that this yep. place celebrates? How do they celebrate? Who are some of the heroes, as you said, the legends, 
Yeah. Um, what are some norms that I need to be aware of? And uh, yeah. they'll have a written policy and you say, what's, what's not in this that I should be aware of? <laughs> um, artifacts. They may, not, they may not know what's in the policy manual. Right, they may not. Um, <laughs> but Probably. even artifacts, you may see things on the wall and you go, what is that? Um, yeah. You know, what's that alpaca rug that has the fourfold gospel on it? You know, what, what's that labor thing? Yeah, so that's an alliance thing. Um, okay. <laughs> you know, what's that all about? And how important is yeah. it here? Yeah. Um, what does that logo mean? What does, yeah, what does that logo mean? And then you'll really <laughs> test their understanding of their, their heritage. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, just before uh, we're going to continue conversation here, but I want to tell you that what we've done today is is just start this conversation. Uh -huh. Dr. Young has uh, actually prepared a, uh, a deep dive on this called Navigating Career Transitions. And we want to, if you're really wanting to go further in this subject, this is just an introductory today, you may want to take a look at this deep dive here because there are perils that happen in, trend, in career transitions, and yet there are also promises. And how do you do this? And the perils and promises of role exits are really important. So uh, Dr. Young goes into more detail here about navigating these career transitions. Um, and there's going to be six teaching videos, some worksheets, and personalized support as needed. And uh, here's what you'll take away. A deep grasp of what's happening in times of career changes, a way to frame your own journey, a date and a guide for your road ahead, and how to avoid the perils of careless exit and grasp the promise of exiting well. So we just invite you to uh, consider that. But as we come to the, the last few minutes here, um, any other any comments from some of you about the whole about some of the ideas that Terry presented about entering your next role? What do you what do you uh, respond about that? That was uh, that it's Doug Dan. That was my um, kind of impetus for for making sure I, I caught the web webinar today. Um, <clears throat> I am uh, uh, looking at uh, trying to, uh, to exit uh, a couple of the roles that I'm in right now. Um, I, I'm sort of clear that the exit ramp is there. I'm just not sure where the, where the entrance is. Um, uh, as, as, as you know, I, I did retire, quote, officially retire from, from, uh, uh, from the church uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, I, I've, I've uh, uh, looked at some, uh, uh, doing some transitional work with, with churches, that sort of thing, um, but I'm still not totally clear on, on is that my, is, is that the, the entrance point for me? Um, um, uh, for the first time, well, for the first time since I was about 20, I'm, I'm unclear about uh, uh, what, uh, what the next step is. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, for 45 years in pastoral work, I was always clear about you know what uh, what that would look like, um, and uh, and the community work that I've been involved in uh, that sort of thing. But but that seems to be seems to be time to to to, to, to you know the to, to leave that behind, um, and I'm okay with that. I think, um, um, uh, but I'm I'm sort of. Uh, in in uh, in transition, I guess myself in terms of of uh, where the you know where the uh, how to get back onto uh, to whatever that next road is. So yep. um, I've appreciated some of the thoughts uh, shared today, um, and I'll take a look at uh, a couple of the books that have been suggested as well. Yeah, yeah. One, One of the books we did not post here is a book by Bruce Feeler. Uh, it's a new book called Life is in the Transitions, and uh, it's a very, very valuable resource. It's, it's relatively new. It would be the uh, Bridges work brought up to 2020 kind of thing, but Life is in the Transitions. Um, and Doug, to your point, um, our thinking is greatly changing these days. Our whole idea about retirement, um, thankfully, there's some there's some, and we deal with this in the, in the, in the webinar or the deep dive is that we really have some fallacies related to life course that we need to confront. Uh, because at the age at which you're at, Doug, uh, you carry an incredible amount of crystallized wisdom. 
And the great tragedy of our culture is the degree to which we have we have in essence said, well, at the very point when people get crystallized wisdom is the very point we say, uh, you should now ascend and make your way off the edge of the cliff. <laughs> and we're, we're, that it's changing. And so uh, that's a good thing. Um, and the whole matter of what is 65 anymore? It, you know, we thought we talked freedom 55. I have a book on my shelf called 55 underemployed and faking normal. Um, so <laughs> those are great titles. Wow. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> and by the way, in her book, she talks about shaping resilient circles. Um, yeah, that's one of the critical pieces. Yeah. So it's having people around you is, yeah. is critically important. And that, in fact, that's one of the, one of the great benefits of joining a crest cohort. We, we have a course for people like you you're in your demographic. And we have this ongoing conversation for about two years and we have great conversations together and people process are processing a lot of life in that time. So uh, if you're interested in joining that group, we're going to be starting new groups in the fall. We'd welcome you to consider either an in-person or uh, we can even do it online. We have a couple of ways of doing it. Now it is 11 o'clock. I promise we'd, we'd let you all go at 11. Uh, although we will say any of you that want to stay on, you're welcome to stay on and we'll continue this conversation. But if you need to go, please feel free and um, we'll be look forward to for the next webinar that we offer. Thank you all for being here. Yes, good to have you here. Well, if there's any of you that want to continue a conversation with a question or a comment here, we'd be glad to continue here for as long as we would like. I just want to say that was excellent. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, always interested in more things that you're offering through Quest. And I, I think as much as ever, maybe more uh, people are in transition yep. uh, right now. These last two years have been a, uh, I don't know where you'd put that in there <laughs> as far as the, the voluntary or involuntary, but it's a pivot point. Right. Uh, so many changes in, in ministry as well as in, in business. Yep. So really really good this yeah, is well, in fact a theme that we really spent a lot of time in the whole course is this whole matter of transitions okay and, and the emotional journey that we go through yeah. like and and in crest we begin with uh, the first the first year is is really getting clear about your identity again who are you again yeah. and what are your values that that's the first piece of clarity and then mm -hmm. in the second piece we talk about then well then how do you how do you lead or or, or function out of that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like a two-year journey of, okay. of really yeah. thinking deeply about these things that's excellent so I, I do have one question do you find and i don't know if, if in the midlife stage or or other but it, it be, can become a life crisis point where people actually need to get get therapy like counseling therapy and time but um to oh. resolve issues that um you know aren't typically covered in courses um yes yes like those get discovered or uncovered well we we're not a deep counseling ministry but uh just the process of of rethinking and and reframing your life can help a lot and then if something really serious is discovered, then we would, we would refer to professional counseling. Yeah. But usually professional counseling is only needed if a person is stuck or has got yeah. some unresolved issue that they just haven't got processed. And what we do in Christ is we offer a process where you can actually think it through. And we're amazed at the transition and the transformation we see within the two years. It mm -hmm. is truly stunning. And mm -hmm. often it's just having a safe place to talk about these things and another place to hear other people tell their stories. Okay. Boy, th that just helps you process yours and, and people transform. It's, it's mm -hmm. Someone has said that uh, midlife, our 30s and 40s are the point in our life when we can no longer keep all the tennis balls under the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good <laughs> we sort of we sort of realize okay there's some stuff that i just can't keep under anymore it keeps popping up yeah and, uh, that's the journey of of uh you know dealing with things and yeah that's, yeah. that's a good thing yep yeah yeah in fact uh, a flourishing second half which is our goal and our our, our mandate in crest 
it has a lot to do with simply processing life up to this point yeah. and, and getting clear on our identity and then becoming confident about what God's doing and what the future looks like. Okay. You flourish. You flourish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a great little book by uh, Michael Abrashov. Uh, he's, he writes about, he was the uh, commander of a Navy ship. Um, I could maybe try to find it for you, Jen, but he had a, he had a few little questions. Once you get into your new role, uh, when he took over command of the ship, he would sit and talk with even the, uh, you know, the 19, 20 year old, you know, Navy seaman who just was a kid almost. And uh, he had certain questions he asked them about what, what are some things you would like to see me really lean into? Um, mm -hmm. And it empowered that group team. It just simply, here's the commander asking me, you know, what, what's something you hope I don't change? Yep. I mean, yeah. And he actually led the, it was one of the poorest performing ships in the Navy. And within a couple of years, it was the most, the best performing ship in the Navy. And it was all a matter of just taking, taking responsibility for his own leadership and, and uh, communicating with the people he was leading and allowing them to speak into even his own leadership. Yeah. yeah. All right. It, it, it's so helpful to have a process when you're feeling lost and it's like you have no sense of direction and you, you know, you're in a dark room, like just to have some idea of movement, even if it's initially wrong movement is yeah. sometimes, but um, when I've looked through literature because of, because uh, mentoring and coaching emerging leaders has been a formal part of my different roles over time. When I've looked for like, what are, what's good, um, what are good templates? What are uh, good books on this topic? The, I, I, I think that uh, a weakness, a general kind of weakness has been that is that they're almost too uh, about human process and, and, and uh, humanly discernible markers. And uh, so I'm looking for pushback if so, because I'm kind of, pro I'm processing on the go here, but like, I, I, I'm thinking more and more about uh, that this, the kind of transition we're talking about or possible transition is, is uh, primarily a process of listening to God, of, of discerning like his leading, his timing, his purposes. Because um, I think that if we're working through questions of process and what are the markers for things, they're helpful in a lot of contexts, but there is time, time when, when um, we maybe despite having massive dissonance and massive conflict and massive pressure, uh, if, if we actually have a sense of God's, a, a clear confirmed leading of God, we can have like a, a, a bizarre sense of peace mm -hmm. and his provision in the midst of what by all the markers would seem like you need to leave right hmm. and, and so i think you know in when we're in a in an era when we're a time of that you know liminality when we're all feeling dissonance it's hard to discern what what is human restlessness and what is holy restlessness yeah. and so i that's i use those terms when i'm meeting with guys because i you know there is such thing as good restlessness that god allows us to experience and uh, so, you know, so anyways, that, that's yeah. that, the whole thing of that discernment process, which it, it makes the communal part all the more important in my mind, because you have to do that in a, pro in a process where you have people walking with you that are also listening to God. And, and off, because the clarity of the confirmation of God's hand is powerful when God speaks by his one spirit to multiple people who did not discuss things, right? Like yeah. that as an example, yeah. right? Yep. And one other thing that is um, a, a, a uh, another I don't know what to call it, like a, a factor or kind of grid in this is um, actually um, when we're talking in a small group about Clinton and Stanley's work about mentoring and mentoring constellations all that I had colleagues who are not um, Euro Canadians 
Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting. They did not have as satisfying a, a time going through their, that, like they went down to floor for like an extended kind of like your life trajectory arc. And I remember that it is very interesting debriefing that they felt like the dynamics that I found have found so powerful in my own life are, were, were more culturally and sociologically defined than, than is recognized. And, you know, like, like ideas and expectations around roles and identities are, are sociologically informed. So they, we shouldn't be surprised if the ethnoculturally part of this conversation is important. And I think increasingly, because certainly I've seen in the last like 10, 15 years, just the demographic of the emerging leaders that I work with are increasingly those from different cultural backgrounds yeah. and, and even different church traditions. And they're, they're, they're leaders within the many and growing diasporas of the Canadian church. And they're, they're going through dynamics that are like, I have, they're not even on my, they haven't been on my charts in this kind of conversation. So um, anyways, that's another thing that's going to bounce around in my head. I need to ponder more. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a lot more complex when you're, you're from a different culture. I think you're right. Well, Ron, were you going to add anything here? You've got a good a good thought process going, I'm sure. No, actually, I'm I'm more so listening here. I talked within within my group a little bit, okay. but I was more so listening. You know, uh, Matthew has has just spoken. He and uh, you know when we were chatting in a group, he he made the comment that he used to be envious of when he when he looked at high level leaders and saw how they had this brain trust these experienced leaders that they could rely on and turn to as mentors and he thought you know wouldn't it be great if i could have something like that and so he was sharing that that's what he's you know created for himself and that resonated with me because i've often felt the same way that uh yeah, it'd be nice to have more of a uh, a pool of people to draw on, but I haven't taken too much initiative to develop that. But I, I that was interesting to hear that. So how did you how do you find those people, Matthew? Yeah, I don't know if I have a, a clear like uh, steps to it, but I definitely I, I I have be as I get older, I have become bolder. Hmm. So leaders who are just I just revered and I almost had on a pedestal and you know like the, like boy that is that is the, the the kind of uh ministry that's the kind of life of integrity that's the kind that I you know I, I'm becoming bolder to contact those people and ask and like worst case scenario they say no but oftentimes I, I I'd say far more often than not I'm shocked at the response that a uh, getting response and e even to the point of to, I will read books and if I feel like I've you know that that mentoring at a distance you know you read a book and it resonates so deeply yeah. and, and it's profoundly changing you and so I'll even have something I would never never have done as of my younger self I'll reach out to an author or something you know or yeah. or a professor or something and just you know whatever note the appreciation but ask a question and I've been, God has blessed me by having like, like living giants of the faith hmm. respond back shockingly to me and wow. have walked with me in a season. And that was, and clearly in hindsight, that was God's answer for like, Lord who, um, but it's, it's not only wisdom and experience, but I, I put a very high priority and in trying to identify people in my life who are true intercessors. So they're, they're, they're profoundly people of prayer in what other capacities they are. And they have, they have far more discernment, but I'd even say gift of discernment because I find that having those in my advisory council that I create it for whatever the circumstance, they often hear God in ways that when they speak something, it, it's the, the it's like a lightning bolt and I realized oh that was there all the time and I just did not discern that I like so I, I I put a high value in what other what what are whatever other gifts they would bring to the table I, I look for that 
um, a, a depth of spiritual maturity in their prayer life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Very good. That's great. I have to head out, but I'll, I'll tell you one of my big takeaways. I have a half sheet here. I came to this for myself because I'm, I'm, I'm def definitely entering into what's probably going to be major transition. But you know what? God was speaking to me this whole time that that I need how to create orientation, uh, how to create on ramps for others and how to release and bless others well. Yes. And that was not on my radar. That has not been on my radar. And that's like, that's just so huge for me. Yeah. And it's, yeah. So that's a very unexpected gift from, from today. So thank you very much. Uh, that's yeah. great. Good. Good. Very good. Bless you, Matthew. Okay. Bless you, Ron. See you again. Okay. Bye Thank for you. Now. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.